Hello, everyone. I wanted to welcome you to the Monday before our Bloomin' Blues uh, workshop, which starts tomorrow. We are going to be painting this fun painting starting tomorrow, this time. So I want to see, I see Shay is signed up. I see Christina is signed up. I see... Um, hey, good to see you, Bay, and good to see you, Anne. I want you all to drop an emoji or say hey if we're going to be seeing you tomorrow at this time. Whoops. <laughs> um, I am today here in the studio. We are recovering. We had a incredible show this weekend here in our hometown in St. Pete, Florida. So I just thought that we could meet, and I'd you know, have this be a casual drop-in session where I can show you some different brushwork techniques uh, going into the workshop. This is totally optional. It's fun. Um, I did, good to see you, Linda. Hey, Dee. Hey, Claire. Hey, Tia. I am so excited to hang out with you guys over the next few days. Um, if you have not signed up for our workshop yet, we have the link in the comments and it's in the description. It is only $27. And I did want to make a big announcement that this is the last workshop we are going to be doing that will be open to the public. From here on out, these workshops that we do quarterly that are um, like a multi-day event and live, they are going to be for our Creative Circle members only uh, and they're we might release them after the fact, but if you want the kind of in-person experience and you want to be able to ask your questions while we're doing it, this is your last opportunity to do it at this price. We are definitely, um, you know, our Creative Circle members are our VIP people. They are incredible and amazing, and we want to be able to pour all of our energy into these people that are making this incredible progress in their art practices. And, um, you know, I want to preserve my energy and uh, make sure that I'm giving my all. So if you have not signed up, this is the last one that we are going to be doing um, definitely this year. So I recommend that you do that. It's only $27. And this isn't just a... Uh, wine and design workshop. This isn't just a paint as you go workshop. This is a robust workshop. And even though we go over a painting from start to finish, and I'm teaching you a lot of the fundamentals of painting and color and design and color mixing and composition, it's things that you would get in like a, a multi-day in-person workshop uh, that you know, costs $500 if you were to do this experience in person. So we go through a lot and um, you will come away with so much knowledge. You will come away with so much experience and have a, have a beautiful painting at the end of it. So we really recommend that you do this. Um, love to have you join, in, join us. And like I said, this is going to be the last time that we offer this in this format um, for this price and definitely this year. Um, we have two more of these workshops throughout the year for our Creative Circle members, but they're only going to be available within the membership. So if you're not one of our members, um, this is the last time to join and we hope you, we hope you can do that. Uh, good to see you, Robin. Good to see you, Anne. Good to see you, Catherine and Marissa and Sharon. Um, hey, Regina. Um, oh, Teresa snuck in during work. It's so good to see you. Yeah, these hydrangeas are going to be fun. All right. I wanted to just show you guys. All right. So I have to just show you some brush techniques. I have some of my Canva paper right here. And um, I got all these camera angles all awkward. So... <laughs> <laughs> Trying to stay in the camera frame is always a challenge. Um, I have Canva paper, and Canva paper is this great product by Canson. It is paper that is made for mixed media, but it is uh, it has a kind of canvas texture to it, and it's made to take paint. Um, 
And I like to use it because it is kind of a good stand-in for canvas. It's less expensive. I take big sheets of 16 by 20 and cut it down into eight by tens. So it's kind of like uh, sketchbook pages. And I don't necessarily have to have it in an entire sketchbook. It's not bound. Um, and if I like what I create on this, great. You know what I can do? I can frame it. I can stick it in a frame and keep it. And if I don't like it, all right, rip it up, tear it up, paint over it, whatever. Um, it's not so precious. I haven't spent a giant bomb on practicing. And so when we're, especially when we're learning, it's important to be able to get the reps in. You will learn so much more from doing five little paintings than you will from doing one big painting. So I like to encourage everyone to, you know, find something that's going to break the mold and not have you worry about wasting. Um, because practice is not waste. Practice is learning. Practice is exercise. Practice is going to get you to the place where you actually in the long run waste a lot less. Um, but you do have to do that practice in order to, um, or I need to go this direction. There we go. <laughs> Um, you do need to do the reps and um, in order to get to the place where you can do it without thinking. And in order to do the reps, that's where I recommend like Canva paper or um, uh, a sketchbook or some kind of surface that isn't precious. Canvas can be expensive. Boards can be expensive. So, you know, get your practice, get your reps in on something less expensive, something easy. And what to, what I'm going to show you today is just um, some brush techniques. I'm not going to actually do a painting. It's just some things to think about while you're using, um, while you're, while you're working on flowers specifically. Um, oh, I did want to mention uh, that if you are in the workshop, that is not the same as the Painting of the Week Club. This is a standalone three-day workshop. Um, there is no Painting of the Week broadcast today or tomorrow. There is no Painting of the Week broadcast this week in public because we will be doing the workshop. If you are a Painting of the Week Club member we do have a uh, replay available for you on your learning platform. And also, if you're a Painting of the Week Club member, that does not automatically give you access to the workshop. Only Creative Circle members get free access to the workshop. All right, so all of these paints are um, heavy body. They're a couple different brands, but they're heavy body, so they're a thicker consistency. Um, so if I were to take my paintbrush and just kind of drag it across, you'll notice that after a while, my paint runs out. And it's funny, in between different pigments, different brands, there will be a slight difference in consistency. For example, the magenta is always thicker, it's always clumpier, it's something to do with the pigment, I don't know why. But it, it just is the way it is, and as you get familiar with your colors, as you get familiar with your paints, you'll find quirks. You'll find some paints are creamier, some colors are just, see this yellow is much creamier. I don't have to put as much on the brush to get as good of coverage. You, you never know. And, and you learn to develop <clears throat> a feeling. And you learn to develop, all right, this is a little bit thicker. It's a little bit clumpier. This is a little bit creamier. 
and you kind of learn to adapt. It's like uh, if you're cooking and you learn to taste your dish as you go rather than uh, specifically following a recipe. Um, it's as you get more mastery of it, you'll develop an innate feeling. But it, it, it's a skill, it's a sense, it's a, um, it, it's just a technical ability that develops over time. I am using, the brands that I am using are Golden, and I have a couple, <clears throat> Charvin, but Golden is the same. These two that I'm currently using are both Golden, and uh, the Magenta, same brand, both heavy body. The Magenta, every single time I have it, it is a thicker, uh, t for tougher consistency. It just isn't as quite as creamy as the yellow. And it doesn't matter how many times I have bought the color, it's just thicker. So if you find that your paint is a little bit thicker or if it feels a little bit dried out, you have two options. One option is to use a little bit of water, and that is not technically the recommended option because it uh, can change the can, it can change the chemical makeup of the paint, but instead you can add a little bit of this high, either high flow medium, gel medium, matte medium, one of these acrylic mediums that has like this is a very liquid consistency basically what it does is it helps to water down the paint and I'll just take a little bit of that and use it to make the magenta a little bit less thick a little bit less chunky and then I don't have to use as much paint if I want to get a better stroke. So if you are struggling with your paint, you can add just a little bit of water or you can add a little bit of medium to get it to flow a little bit easier. Um, I would recommend medium over water. However, I often just use water um, because it's what's sitting next to me. Those of you that have painted with me before, a lot know that I just reach for what's closest. So as soon as I have my one brush, I tend to finish whatever I'm doing with that one brush instead of changing up my brushes. If the water's next to me, I use just a touch of water instead of medium. You know, it's, you'll find you do what's most comfortable for yourself. Um, and so as much as I teach you, you'll gravitate towards something that works best for yourself. Um, Sharon, I would say use the medium, not the retarder, because the retarder, um, unless you purposefully want to elongate the uh, drying time, retarder will make your paints dry slower, which if you're not, you, if, if that's what you want, that's great, you can use that instead of medium, but just be aware that it changes your drying time. Okay. Um, now, this is kind of how some hacks you can do to make the paint easier to work with. Um, I'm currently, <clears throat> I pulled up some, I pulled up some flowers, just like random. I have paint escaping brushes, brushes on the loose. <laughs> I just pulled up a few random flowers for my references to kind of give you guys some ideas of what techniques you can use <coughs> when you are doing flowers. So one thing about flowers that I have found is it helps to use fewer brush strokes rather than more brush strokes. Um, the more brush strokes you use, the more uh, the tighter it gets, it'll easily look overworked. So what I like to do is I like to really put my brushes through the paces. Um, so I will get a brush 
and this is a bright, for example, and I will explore all the different kinds of um, what my brush can do, like all the different kinds of marks that I can make. So I'll go fat, I'll go skinny, I'll twist it, I'll really kind of examine what my brush can do and see, I'll get super creative with the shapes that I make and I'll see how skinny I can get with a certain brush. I'll see how much pressure I have to apply and I'll see like, look, that is a petal right there. And I unintentionally kind of even made it shaded at the bottom. So then I'll try doing a couple more of those, see if I can get another petal shape. And so I'll just sit there, kind of twist the brush as I go to see what sort of shapes I can get. And as I learn and really put the brush through the paces, it helps me understand what tools I have at my own disposal. So let's take a sunflower for instance. Um, it's kind of a yellowy orange. And I'm gonna, this is a smaller brush. This is a six, so this is actually pretty small. I usually paint with a bigger brush, but um, I have a couple, I'm using a bright size six, and like I said, it's smaller. And I'm using um, just a random sunflower picture that I have sitting around for inspiration, and I'm gonna try and see what I can do And I'm, and so I'm basically, I take, I have the brush at an angle at the tip. I don't want my hand in the way here. So I have my brush straight up and down. So the tip is touching the paper. And what I do is I mush the brush for lack of a better term. And then I kind of release the pressure and it creates a blob, which is remarkably in the shape of a petal. So um, a, lot, a lot of painting is creative mushing. <laughs> you know, like uh, this is a smaller filbert. Um, oh dear. I, this, so this is where we talk about like sizes are arbitrary. It's kind of like vanity sizing with jeans. This is a size six. This is a size 12. They're both long handled. This one makes you feel better about yourself, right? The six, <laughs> but they're both basically the same size. Like, um, it's it's like trying to buy jeans from Black House White Market. They, uh, <laughs> the, you fit into a four, and then by the end of the day, they're the size of like a sixteen, right? <laughs> um, so, it's it can be a little challenging when we give you sizes is um, because brand to brand and everything like that, they're really pretty, uh, you never, just kind of look at, at the scale of a paper. Like if I were doing a bigger painting, I would want a bigger, thicker brush um, for what we're doing this is probably too big. You know, like uh, if I would probably use this size on something like a six by six or a smaller than an eight by 10, I would start using this at an eight by 10 and work my way up. And, and then if I'm gonna get even bigger, then I would use something like this. So just kind of, as you're looking at the size of the canvas that you're using, look at your brushes in context of what you're doing. And I would recommend going a little bit, if you're trying to get loose, I would recommend going a little bit larger than what feels comfortable. Because that will keep you loose. The smaller you are, the more you're gonna wanna get in there with every little tiny detail and have small strokes. A bigger brush forces you to have bigger strokes. Okay, so 
a guy, <laughs> a controlled mush and blob, if you will. Um, this is a filbert. So a filbert has a little bit different shape. It has a rounded tip and it can kind of fan out. And depending on the pressure that you use, you can make that feel like a flower. So when you really put a lot of pressure on the brush, it creates a petal shape. And then as you bring the pressure up, I kind of twist the brush a little bit to, to the side to get it to a point. And it will release, it will release pressure, but I still get a really good application of paint and it still looks very painterly. So you can do some really cool things with your brush if you kind of get in there and um, you, you do have to learn your tools to a certain extent. <clears throat> How would I make, so Sharon, same thing. I just try, I do as much as I can on to have each stroke be kind of one stroke. So this, is a little bit, that's more of a bottom petal. You know, it's, it's a little bit foreshortened. It's kind of here. And then if you have a value change, you can come back and kind of do one, do one, uh, like have the value change come in. But the, especially for the base layer, the fewer number of brush strokes that you can use, the looser it is gonna, going to look. So, um, uh, the, the chip brush, the chip brush. Yes, I am more than happy to talk about the chip brush. We always get questions about that. A chip brush is essentially a big old cheap brush and um, you can find them at the hardware store uh, if you're spending more than a couple dollars on these, you're spending too much. We use them for gesso or we use them for gesso or backgrounds. Um, when we tone the canvas first thing tomorrow, so we will tone the canvas together. Um, we will use one of these and it is, uh, you just use it for big areas. It is not expensive. This one, they're also not terribly great quality. This one is already rusting. It's been used about twice. Um, so I recommend not letting them sit in the water because they rust and they do shed bristles like no other. So this is for big areas that you just need a lot of coverage. Um, so this is like a good background brush if you're doing a big painting or something like that. Um, let's see. I'm looking through y'all's questions and comments. So when when I'm painting, uh, when I am painting flowers, in addition to trying to use um, have it in as few brush strokes as possible, I try to kind of go with the flow of the petal. And as I'm painting in general, it, if you go with the direction of the thing that you're painting, um, like grass, for example, if you, if you kind of paint in the direction that the grass is growing, for example, it kind of creates that texture. You know, it, uh, if you paint like this and the grass is growing up and down, it will, you know, it, it doesn't quite create the same texture. So I tried to have my strokes in general be similar to the direction of the thing as it's moving across the, the light across a surface. So for example, I'm trying to think of like, like a, um, so if you think of like a petal, I'm, notice how I'm kind of moving my brush 
in the direction, if this is a pedal, this is the back, this is as it moves forward. I'm gonna, as it bends forward towards the light, I'm gonna follow that a little bit. If I were to paint across this way, it just kind of, it, it directionally makes your eye move that way. And so it looks like the petal should be going in the direction of your brush stroke. So if you can keep your brush moving as the petal moves, it will help create the movement within the flower um, that makes a little bit more sense. So as I'm doing, for example, since I have pink on my brush, I'm gonna just do pink. In the shape of the sunflower, for example, if I go with the direction of the petals, as they move, it just kind of visually makes more sense. You can do that right here. And these little short front ones So notice how as I move my brush with the direction the petals are moving. Sorry, the words are um, after two days at the show. It's, it's, uh, sometimes my words don't come as easily. But um, if I move my brush in the direction of the petal, it visually creates movement and flow and the paint kind of goes in that direction and you get that feeling and it really helps define the petal and give the feeling of movement. Um, so that, that's another tip, is to move your brush in the direction that the flower is moving. Um, let's see, Judy says, your store is out of teal heavy body, but you have golden liquid teal. Yeah, golden liquid teal is fine. It will be a little bit uh, more liquidy, so just be mindful of that as you are using it. It can sometimes feel a little bit runny. Um, Claire, did it take me a while to uh, <laughs> keep my palette in such neat piles? My palette is always a big mess. You know, it depends. Sometimes mine is a big mess. Other times, like when we're going from one session to another, if it's if it's getting in my way, I'll just clean it and keep going. So I'll scrape it away and then keep going. But I, I kind of, it has a mind of its own, honestly. Um, <laughs> I, I just work with it for as long as I can until it becomes unwieldy and then I clean it and start over. Let's see. Yeah, liquid teal works. Um, let's see what else. Oh leaves so leaves are always a great question and also you know like how, how do you get detail in the flowers so i'm going to add i'm just adding a little bit of a dark color so you can add details and you can add shadows and we'll go through this with the hydrangeas um because we generally work those of you that know, know and have done this before, what do we do? We work dark to light and neutral to bright. And so we start with the darkest colors and we come in with lighter colors on top of it. But by just getting a few, I'm kind of doing this a little bit backwards because we put the mid-tone in and then we put the dark in, which is a little bit of the reverse of what I would normally do. And the sunflower is not typically pink, but you know, we can kind of come in and still see the idea of what the flower is just because of the value. If you get the flower right, this kind of looks more like a um, Gerbera a little bit, which I guess a pink, Pink sunflower is a kind of looks like a Gerbera, so <laughs> why not? Um, uh, Sharon, uh, absolutely, yeah, get golden. 
Golden is a great brand. Highly recommend it. I, I prefer not to get, like there are some that get really, really thick, super impasto, and that kind of paint, when the paint gets extra, extra thick, then you almost need to use a palette knife instead of a brush. Brushes, uh, you need to be able to spread the paint. So if it's too uh, clumpy, if it's too much like, like a super stiff toothpaste, that's gonna be tough to spread with a brush. You know, brushes, have spring to them, you know, they, they, and if you think of like a, a, what you would use with toothpaste is a toothbrush and they're, those bristles are not nearly as soft as a paintbrush. So it wouldn't be able to spread a thicker consistency nearly as easily. Um. <laughs> Your cats steal your brushes and you think they're inside your box spring. Oh my goodness, that is too funny. <laughs> uh, Rosemary can probably, Rosemary can definitely empathize. She has a whole bunch of fur pals at her house and I know Leroy, her cat, um, is part of the reason why she does collage now because he was a big floofy white and black cat and so it was really difficult to do oil painting when you have all of this fur escaping into your paint. So we all have our challenges and we all have our um, fur babies that we are going to keep regardless of <laughs> how they impact our art, right? <laughs> um, okay, so I wanted to show you guys a couple of things with leaves. Leave, leaves and petals, these are at their base, they're super organic forms you know it's not it's not like a box you know it's it's not like a cube or a box that has hard edges it a leaf is a very organic form and so light will move across the leaf organically and so just like with a petal you know you can do very, very similar shapes. Like a leaf is essentially a mush, a controlled mush. You know, I would not recommend coming in and like drying out the leaf like uh, an oval with, you know, the vines. That it winds up looking too controlled, too perfect. Like in life, leaves are different. They turn towards you. They turn away from you. They kind of have edges. Um, you can, you can use your brush to do thin leaves and you can use it to do fat leaves. And, you know, if you similar to a flower, uh, well, a little bit different from a flower. Sometimes, especially with these fat leaves, it's, you're not going to be able to get it in one brush stroke. So that's where I like to go kind of with the grain of the leaf so that you feel, that's where, you know, okay, so you feel the vein. So I'll, I'll for example, I come down with the center and then kind of pull it down so you kind of feel once again you feel the surface of the leaf you f you know how when you look at a leaf you kind of see the grains you'll you'll see a, a little bit of a texture and there's usually like a light side and a dark side to a leaf if you follow the texture if your paint follows the direction of the object it'll just once again, it'll have that feeling of movement. It'll have that feeling of flow. So that's something that you can do to still be loose, but still feel uh, that movement in an object. Um, so, and then with, then you have, uh, this. these are like for pedal heavy uh, 
flowers that have a lot of individual petals. So like sunflowers, daisies, that kind of thing. When you have something like a rose or a hydrangea, you have more of like a, a bigger mass. You have kind of like a bigger object. So if you have like a, a clump of flowers, for example, you know, you, you kind of come in and you want to define the clump of flowers. Uh, let me see. I usually need something to look at, otherwise it, it just doesn't. Uh, let's see. Like, no, I think this is good. Just even like hydrangeas in general, like they're, they're kind of like puffs of cotton candy. Um, I love hydrangeas. They were, they were some of my wedding flowers. Um, I grew up and they'd, you'd get the, uh, uh, in my parents' neighborhood, I would, there are some people that have managed to control the pH of their soil so that like they get the rainbow of hydrangeas all the way from the deep blue to like the purpley pink in this, in the same yard. And I love, I've always just loved seeing that. And so like these, you're not going to necessarily see the individual, um, flowers as much, you're going to kind of see the form as it moves. And so you want to, like anything else, keep it loose, define the form, define the uh, general feeling and how the light moves across it. And there's always going to be a lighter edge. And so I just come in with a little bit more white and kind of use chunkier brush strokes to make it feel like the flowers. So I look at the entire object and as the light is hitting it, how the value and color shift. And so with something like hydrangeas, you don't necessarily need to worry as much about the individual petals because what your eye sees especially if you're more than three feet away is the general idea of the object. So don't worry too much about like individual ones. Um, you know, if, if you want to do texture, you can, you can get in here and you can mush it. And once again, it's, it's just mush. That is literally add a little bit more white, And then add a little bit more white. I'm just squishing my brush. And that's if you want to get a little bit more texture. So there are a couple different feelings that you can get with the, f with the flowers. And it's up to you. What I generally do um, is I like to kind of come in with these bigger strokes and then put a little bit of texture on top so that it doesn't feel too worked. Um, And you know, you can get you can get wild, you can get crazy, you can um depending on what you're doing, you can kind of come in and if you want, you can use the back end of your brush and you can get polka dots. Your brush can be used in so many different ways. I really encourage you, we if you're in the creative circle, we actually have an entire section on like putting your brush th through the paces and some different things to try. So I would recommend doing that. And we have some tips and like kind of some worksheets to work off of to really experiment with your brushes, to see what tools you can do, to like see what you can mush around. Um, even this, for example, I kind of liked the texture, but then it kind of uh, smushed the paint too much. And uh, I lost some edge. I lost some definition and so I don't like this texture as much. What I would probably prefer to do is come in with some lighter on this one and kind of add texture on top. 
but then I can still see the underpainting, so it feels a little bit more painterly. This feels a little bit overworked to me, actually. So, you know, it's you go in and you figure out what works for you. Um, there's all kinds of different techniques that you can use to really uh, examine examine what you're doing, enjoy it, um, try different things. Like, take take a take a pink and and just see see what load up your brush and just see what you can do you know i generally like to i like to start with some of the the dark edge of one so i would probably start like this and then i would continue the stroke with a little bit lighter version of it and you get the general shape and this this would be a beautiful rose petal so um, what we're gonna be doing over the next three days is we're gonna be working with some brush technique we're gonna be working with color mixing we're gonna be designing and talking about composition as we do um, as we do this uh, project together. So we have, um, we have a great three days. You don't need to come with anything other than your white canvas. We are gonna start at the very beginning and we're gonna tone the canvas together. I'm going to sketch the composition onto the canvas and then we are going to go over three days. Um, we'll talk about the kind of painting system that I use, which involves finding the color masses, working with that, and, and working from uh, dark to light, neutral to bright. And over the three days, we have kind of three stages. And I, I call the first stage the, um, it's we're building the bones of the house. If we can get the bones right and we can get the structure right of the painting, we're good for the rest of the painting. And then the second day is what I like to call our awkward teenager phase. We've worked through the values. We'll have, a, we'll start getting the color masses. We'll kind of start seeing where it's going, but it's not going to be pretty. <laughs> it's, and I, that's usually the stage where I am always questioning my life decisions. And I'm like, where am I going with this? And I'm not sure what we're, we're what I'm going to do, but you know what? Trust the process and stick with me through that second day, by day number three, we do what I call the icing on the cake. And that's where our little painting gets its glow up and all of a sudden it pops. You can see where it's going, you can see what it's doing. We put in the details, we put in the extra little flourishes. Um, that's where we can improvise a little bit and it all of a sudden just comes together. So, you know, dig deep into yourself and come with us over the next few days and we'll have this wonderful painting experience and I'll show you color, composition, design, how to mix colors. Uh, we answer your questions as we go. So whether you're a beginner or a more advanced painter, you'll have something to take away from this lesson. Um, so don't forget, we have the link to sign up in the description today. And then we also have it in the comments. We start tomorrow at noon. We have a private, uh, a private website. This is not gonna be on Facebook. So if you are looking for our live experience in Facebook, you won't find it there. You only get the link if you sign up and it is $27. And uh, once again, this is the last time we're gonna do that this year. Um, we're not gonna have our workshops open to the public for the rest of the year. They're only for the creative circle. So, um, I hope that you all join us for that, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Um, oh, yes, Sherry, I apologize. Uh, each session is going to be about an hour long. I try to really be respectful of everyone's time. If you can't make that, that's great. If you need to leave early, it's not a problem. That's what replays are for, and honestly, uh, all of our members can chime in that have done this before, but most of our people that have done this in the past, and we, we've now had thousands of people go through our workshops, they always recommend that you come show up, take notes, kind of watch it, and then 
wait to paint it on your own. Um, we Every now and then we get some people that paint along with me, but in order to take this painting and fit it into three sessions, we do have to move at a certain pace. So that's where replays are great because uh, you can stop, you can slow down, you can rewind, you can listen to what I had to say again, and we can you can go through it at your own pace. So um, I cannot wait to see you guys tomorrow noon. Uh, if you have signed up for the workshop, there is a secret code for you to text if you would like for to get a link to remember when we are going live. And uh, we will also be sending out the workshop link for you to show up. Um, that's both in your, uh, it's in the workshop dashboard as well as in the emails that you are receiving. So we hope to see you then, uh, noon tomorrow, Eastern. And once again, I have been your teacher, Shelby Dillon, and I look forward to seeing y'all tomorrow. It's gonna be a great week. It always is. We have, we have such a blast together. Um, so. Thank you. I hope y'all are having a great spring and I will see you tomorrow in the workshop. All right.